interesting subjects I have found is, 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 the, is the study of the seminal people, the Jews. Uh, Judaism, after all, maintains in part its, its tribal roots. It's uh, one of the few religions other than, let's say, Zoroastrianism, which is really a tribal religion still. It's, it's beyond faith and culture. It's based on ancestry. It's a blood, it's a blood uh, religion. Many Jews say with no contradiction, I'm an atheist Jew or an agnostic Jew. No other religion can make that claim. Uh, what Jesus did is, is turn the symbol of blood meaning ancestry, into faith. It was a, literally a dramatic change in the way we viewed religion. And it also had a change in the genome and how we understand um, both genetic anthropology and genetic genealogy. Now, we've all heard the phrase, we are, regardless of race, 99.9% .9 the same. That was the common refrain when the Human Genome Project, the crude map of it was revealed in the year 2000. President Clinton said it. Uh, others repeated it. There are articles in the New York Times saying it. That's a meaningless statement. It's statistical mumbo jumbo. First of all, we know now it's not 99.9%, .9%, but it's actually 99.7%. But even more important, that 0.3% is the difference between men and women. It's the difference between why you're short and why you're tall. It's the difference between the color of one's skin. It's the difference between why 494 of the top 500 times in the 100 meters are won by people of West African ancestry and whites. Uh, Asians and East African Kenyans are terrible at the 100 meters. That's not because of culture. It's not because of the food that they eat. It's because of how genetics has shaped our ancestry. There are different groups. There are different population groups. And Jews are one of the subgroups that have become the favorites of geneticists to study because despite the fact that we've lived in separate populations all around the world, very disparate populations, pockets of populations, um, Jews have remained um, in incredibly insular within those communities. The, the rate of Jewish outmarriage up until mid-century of, of, of last century was less than one half of one percent. Absolutely remarkable. Um, no other group, no other minority group or majority group has such that, that kind of genetic solidarity. I wanted to give you some idea from a macro level, talking about population in general, how we trace ancestors with DNA. Um, I mentioned to you that, that I ha had a breast cancer gene, which is common only among Jews. In fact, there are many diseases that are common only among Jews. One, the breast cancer genes are found in what are called the autosomal DNA. And, and the autosomal DNA is very difficult to find because it's so scattered throughout the human genome and there's no real way to trace it. When we, a few years from now, maybe even a decade or two from now, it will be much, much better um, and we'll have the uh, genetic equipment and the mathematical equations to do analysis of human beings by taking their entire human genome and understand what our genetic heritage is uh, that make up who we are. As of now, we can only um, track just two lines of our DNA, two lines of millions of lines of DNA that make up who we are. One is the Y chromosomal DNA, which is passed down intact in men, and the other is mitochondrial DNA that is passed down from woman to woman. We all have mitochondrial DNA. It's in every single cell, but we don't, men do not pass it on to our offspring. It's only passed on from woman, from woman to woman. So I can, if I had my mitochondrial DNA tested, it would test my female line all the way back to the first Eve, first genetic Eve. But if my daughter wanted it tested, she would not be able to track my, my family's maternal DNA. So maternal, the maternal DNA in mitochondria is only passed down from woman to woman. The male DNA is uh, Y is passed down from, from men to men. And this gives you an idea of the kind of tests that are done. Uh, most of the testing that, that you will see at Family Tree DNA and elsewhere is mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomal DNA. Autosomal DNA gives you an idea uh, much more vague about your general heritage, what percentage of your DNA may be Native American, what percentage of your DNA may be European. And it's done through mathematical models, and it's not very exact, but it is something that over time will become the future, I think, of a lot of DNA research. Um, very quickly, this is the human migration map. This has nothing to do with Judaism per se, but this is the human migration maps of the Y chromosome. You can track it because, again, the Y chromosome stays intact. The first male that we've been able to genetically track would be found here in Africa. And you can see some of the African roots, some of the African uh, tree branches stayed in Africa. But the, uh, there was a movement out of Africa. And that's uh, essentially the movement out of Africa that occurred 40 or 50,000 years ago. And all those branches are various genetic lines that can be tracked now through um, Y chromosomal um, tracking. Uh, what's so interesting about uh, the Israelites and later the Jews, 
is that they were a Middle Eastern culture. We know, for instance, that you can look back uh, at the Jewish diaspora in the early Christian era. In one century CE, uh, Jews were mostly concentrated in the Middle East around what is now uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, by the fourth century, they had begun to um, spread to places like North Africa, already uh, spreading into Spain, um, the Alsace, and areas in France that became uh, partly the core of uh, Sephardic Jewry and partly the early uh, elements of Ashkenazi Jewry. By the sixth and eighth century, the largest Jewish community was actually in Rome. And scientists now believe that the uh, Roman Jews contributed most of the DNA to what became Ashkenazi Jewry. Uh, a lot of the lords of uh, the nobility of, of, of France and some of the uh, German regions uh, in the 9th, 10th, 11th century, because of Christian taboos against money lending and other things, called on um, Jews, Jewish traders, and others to come to um, Europe uh, to act as middlemen, to act as tax collectors. That brought a lot of uh, small communities of Jews into that area. And eventually, they, they became the core area of, of Judaism and ended ultimately through persecutions. The Crusades and elsewhere ended up pushing gradually through Central Europe into Eastern Europe and became the core of Ashkenazi Jewry. It's interesting, from maybe 1,000, the, uh, the year 1,000 to the, to the 15th century, even into the 16th century, the Jewish population, the Ashkenazi Jewish population, rarely was lar much larger than 25 to 50,000 Jews. The majority of Jews were Sephardic Jews. Um, that was the center of Jewish civilization. It was quite sophisticated. The Jewish population was quite small. And one of the reasons that we see a lot of Jewish diseases and a lot of Jewish mutations, one of the reasons we can do this kind of DNA tracking is because that population was so small and we have so few um, original lineages that, that track to, which make it actually a gold mine again for scientists to track. But the explosion of, um, of uh, the Jewish population, the Ashkenazi Jewish population, really didn't begin until the 15th and into the 16th centuries. And it was quite bumpy um, because of various massacres and, and pogroms and so forth that stretched out through that time. Uh, as you can see, we've done, the, this is just a chart of some of the Y test, the, the Y chromosomes, and you can really do see that Jews uh, that there are different populations. You can see the, um, the, the yellow grouping over here. Those are the African populations, uh, very much separate genetically from the others. Um, you can see the little circle um, down uh, where it says EGY, Egypt, Tunisia, Ethiopia. They represent a very coherent um, genetic group. You can see Ashkenazis, which is right, uh, that kind of uh, pinkish orange one, or uh, right uh, on, on the uh, line on the, on the right side. Very similar to Syrians, a little bit to Turks, Romans, Kurds, and so forth. But again, this is only the Y chromosomal line. This is only the male line. Um, we do believe that, for, for, for all intents and purposes, Jews came, uh, Ys, the males of Jews, pretty much came uh, from a Semitic background. What was popular in the 1960s was Arthur Kessler's book, The Thirteenth Tribe. You've got to remember, coming out of World War II, uh, there was a lot of concern about you talking about racial separateness, talking about racial specialness. Jews were particularly sensitive to it. They abandoned the notion of race even more aggressively, rejected it even more aggressively than other cultures. Arthur Kessler was part of that liberal um, population that was even quite critical of the state of Israel. You've got to remember that Reform Judaism was very hostile to the Zionist uh, uh, state for many, many years because they thought it was underscoring the sense of Jewish separateness. It really didn't resonate with them. And Kessler put out this book, which really confirmed the politically correct prejudice of the year, which was that Jews were converted from Khazars, uh, the Khazarian population. And there were some, there's some interesting evidence, including coins and extra biblical, obviously the Bible is well past the Bible, that shows there was a, um, a time when the nobility of the Khazars did convert to Judaism in the 8th and 9th century. Uh, but the general belief by Kessler that he was pushing was that everybody in the kingdom converted, which is in fact not true. This is Khazari in the 7th and 10th centuries. And like I said, it was a, uh, the, the Jewish population Probably there, there were some seminal Jews that had come up from the Middle East. There were also Jews that had come up from Rome and ultimately moved, moved through and, and, and pushed over to the Khazarian Empire when some of the uh, Mongols and others and other tribes were, um, were, were very active in, um, in Europe. But the Khazarian conversion was very much limited to the nobility. And in fact, we now have some DNA testing which confirm, confirms that, although 
how many people here know, know what, the, what a Kohanim is, know the whole story of the Kohanim? Okay, so you're familiar with uh, the Jewish priesthood, which we will talk about. So you know there's also Levites, the junior priests, I like to call them. Um, the Levites actually have a very high percentage of Khazarian uh, genes. It ends up, uh, one of the speculations, and it's pretty informed speculations, Karl Skoretsky, um, who was very involved in the Kohanim, um, research is, is one of the uh, believers in this, in this theory. The Khazarians couldn't buy their way into the Jewish priesthood, which they would love to have done, um, because they were noble. They thought they should rightly be Jewish priests, shouldn't they? Uh, they couldn't do that, but they could buy themselves into the Levite priesthood. So uh, they actually, they, there's a belief that many of the uh, Khazarian nobles who did convert became Levites, and that's one of the reasons that there's such a high, odd percentage of, of uh, Khazarian DNA ancestry in Levites, but not found in other Jewish populations. So there clearly is a component um, of Khazarian Jewry, but it's quite small, 5 to 10 percent, and it clearly doesn't fit the, uh, the Kessler um, kind of Jew-hating, I hate to put it in those terms, but that's really what it was, Jew-denying model that suggests that we are not um, descendants from uh, Jews from, from, the, uh, from the Middle East. And of course, that was in the political context of I'm feeling guilty about the um, uh, Jews, uh, European Jews c going to Israel and competing with Palestinians and others over the issue of the right of return. Uh, so ultimately, Jews developed into three major genetic uh, groupings. Um, there's the Middle Eastern Jews, the Jews who stayed in Babylon, who um, remained in the Middle East, Iranian Jews, Iraqi Jews, and so forth, and, and ultimately fled, I think, to Israel when Israel was created, are one, um, the smallest uh, um, uh, numbers of Jews. Uh, Sephardic Jews, which was the center of world Jewry from the seventh century until, um, uh, until the Holy Inquisition, really, uh, numbered well over a million. Um, you have some uh, very, very well-known um, Jews from that period, Jew Jewish intellectuals. And that, there was an era in the 11th and 12th centuries called the Ornament of History, when Jews, um, uh, Muslims, and Christians actually got along very, very well, relatively speaking. And then there's the Ashkenazi Jews, represented quite, quite small, went through a number of uh, what are called genetic bottlenecks, where their population maybe went from 25 to 100,000, then shrunk during the Crusades or the... Um, various massacres back down to 20,000. And it's during that period that the core of Jewish ancestry was formed. As for the female DNA, this is interesting. I have a startling statement to make, which may be that none of you here who are Ashkenazi Jews may be under the laws of Israel Jewish. Um, that is true by DNA, and this is going to present some fascinating uh, theological problems. The reality of it is, is that most of female DNA that they've done testing of traces back to European populations. Whether they were pagan or Christian, it's not clear, but they almost certainly were not Semitic. There, are, there is a, a, a sizable percentage of, of uh, DNA on the female side that does trace back to the Middle East, but the majority of it traces back to Europe and seems to indicate that the pattern of Jewish communities, Ashkenazi Jewish communities, was traders or middlemen, uh, nobility aides, whatever, either brought up by the aristocracy or who wandered there because there was a sense of opportunity during brief periods of openness, and they took on local wives. Now, if they went through a formal conversion process, and that's your genetic line, you are Jewish under Israeli law. If they didn't, if they just took a, a local woman as their wife and that local woman was pagan or Christian, they didn't go through a formal conversion process, if the rabbis of Israel find out about it, you have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that most of us today who are Ashkenazi are probably the descendant of a Semitic Jewish male and a, either a convert or a Christian or pagan who didn't con convert, but quickly was assimilated into the small but soon growing Jewish community, raised their children as Jews, but if you ultimately trace it back, eh, they're not so Jewish. <laughs>